we've had a lot of fun this weekend. Uh, how many of you guys have been a part of the weekend, either here or online watching? Awesome. Look at all, 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 all those hands. It's been a prayer conference. It's been our first prayer conference. And, um, and, and uh, man, it's been absolutely incredible. How do you know that just being in the Pacific Northwest or really being anywhere in the United States of America, prayer is kind of the big deal right now? <laughs> Yep, yep, sure is. And so this has been, man, it's been so powerful. And, uh, and, and just also, just uh, 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 really just seeing what Wanda brings and what Anna brings. Um, and just, I love the diversity within the body of Christ. I love that we really are a body. And, 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 our, and it's a body of, with, with several different um, body parts. <laughs> But they're all, so, they're all so, so important. They're all so needed. And it just feels like the Lord brought who he wanted um, for this house, for this region, and for this season. Because it feels like something has been unlocked uh, this weekend within our hearts, within this house, and within this region. We went yesterday, um, uh, 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 Anna and her team, and I uh, downtown, and uh, it was just incredible, just this spirit-led kind of prayer journey as the Lord was uh, shifting stuff, and, uh, and, and it got a little wild, and I, I believe that we're going to see uh, just such a radical shift um, uh, in Seattle, even as a result of, of this weekend. It's powerful to think that we worship the God over time and space and that we can actually do something in time and space that causes ripples that go out into eternity. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Well, it is kind of funny because in the first service, um, I, I was supposed to do what I, what I never do, and that's uh, greet new people. So um, I thought we would do, I'm just kidding, I greet new people every week. Well, I thought we'd do it here in this service. So um, listen, if you've never actually been in this building before, we just uh, put up your, your hand real high so we can celebrate you this morning. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome. It's good to have you. Great, great, great. Now, on, on your way out, if, if, you're, if, if you're looking for a good church, uh, we'd love to talk. If you're not, then, then just, just, just hurry on out at the end of the service. But, but if you look back here, uh, our team back here, they're waving. Um, they've got a gift bag for you. They'd love to tell you about, about SRC. There's also a little packet of Kool-Aid that you can drink if you feel like this is the right place for you. Um, and so that would be, that'd be a lot of fun. Um, praise the Lord. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, um, <laughs> I was kidding. I was kidding, okay? All right. <laughs> um, in the first service, uh, Anna brought a word on joy and an angel of joy that was being assigned to Seattle and how the enemy's been working overtime to keep this region from the destiny of God, everything that the Lord has in, in store. Something got unlocked. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm, I'm looking forward to this, to this service uh, because we have this incredible um, uh, prophet, this equipper, this teacher uh, within the kingdom of God that's really been on the scene, um, especially this last year. Um, you might have seen her uh, uh, with Steve Schultz on Elijah Streams, uh, featured, of course, on Elijah List. She's written all kinds of books, manuals and resources, equipping the saints uh, for efficient prayer. Um, I like one of the things that she's been saying throughout this weekend. It's not... It's not, um, what, it's not what you pray, uh, but it's really understanding who you are when you pray um, and really praying from the right spot. And, um, and so a lot of times we're looking for hacks and formulas, but really what the Lord's trying to reveal to us in this time is our identity and our destiny presently in Christ so that things can shift. And so we're in for such a, such a treat. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to Wanda Alger for coming, for being a part of this, especially, you, you know, you've never been here before. You don't know who, who we are. Um, on behalf of my mom, thank you. I know she was, she was very, she, my mom was like, she said yes. Ah! She, was run, she was running around the house with the tambourine. It was crazy. Anyways, um, that's my mom, tambourine shofar all day long, just running She's got a prayer shawl. It gets, gets crazy. That's the, that's the Debbie you don't, you don't get to see. Um, anyways, you're in for uh, such a special treat. Sierra Valve Center, would you welcome Wanda Alger as she comes this morning? Come on.
Go ahead and just stretch out your hands. Father, we just thank you, Lord, um, uh, that, that Wanda didn't, didn't just come. But, Lord, you spoke to her, and you called her, and she said yes. And having never been to Seattle before, um, she came in here like a lion, um, ready to take down some, re some religious devils and sacred cows. And, Lord, we thank you, Father, for what's been imparted throughout this weekend. And, Lord, we also just give you thanks and praise Father, for what is in your heart for us today. We thank you, Lord, that this service has never happened before. This time, this space, this place has never happened before. There's a unique composi composition of people and testimonies and, and stories. And, Lord, uh, even this service has its own thumbprint in the spirit. And so, Lord, we choose to not approach this service as just any other service. But we uh, engage with honor in our hearts and with expectancy in our hearts, knowing, Lord, that you want to release a wine that you have never released before. It's new. <laughs> and we give you thanks and praise for Wanda Alger in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. This really has been a divine appointment this weekend. Um, last night was incredible. Uh, just how he anoints and appoints uh, people and hear, to hear your message on joy this morning. My middle name is Joy. I don't know how many times it has been prophesied over me. You know, the joy of the Lord, and I mean it is happening um, for the body of Christ. But this weekend has been reset. It's been a reset weekend. What happened last night? It was reset. We reset our clocks last night. There's a resetting of seasons, an overturning of the governments of the world to the governments of the kingdom. See, government is a good thing because it's kingdom. And there have been worldly governors that are not legitimate. And it's an overturning. And for those who weren't here last night, how many were not here last night? Okay, there were enough of you. So just to give you a little clue, uh, Anna here had, had revealed that the governing angel here is the wisdom of creation. And she shared that uh, on Friday. And when she said that, it just woke my spirit because the angel of wisdom and revelation follows me. And I knew that the Lord was combining these two from the East Coast to the West Coast. These governing angels of wisdom. You know, if you understand scripture, Daniel and Joseph, they were known to be men with the wisdom of the gods. Thus, they were given governing positions. Solomon told the Lord, I can't govern your people without wisdom. And this is why God is looking for a people who know how to govern rightly. By the spirit, by the government of God, by his kingdom. And if you remember the, the scripture that I was pointing to last night and helping to understand. And I really encourage you to, to go back and listen to last night because the admonition in Proverbs 2, because see, God has been, he's been inviting you in this region, the wisdom of creation. And it is, it is closing a power circuit. I don't understand what all happened last night. I really don't. You know, when revelation happens and it hits your spirit, there's just like an amen, yes, that's God. That has power in the spirit. And so just the fact that you received it, we knew, God, this is you, that gives permission, okay, for heaven to respond. And I feel like that's what happened last night. We needed this agreement, okay, over this nation, closing a power circuit. That's how I hear it. It's a power circuit. I've shared before in 2019, I woke up and the Holy Spirit said, or the Lord said, Holy Spirit is about to reset the power grid. Now, that was before anything about, you know, possible blackouts, times of darkness, resetting the power grid. This is resetting everything. And it's not just overturning the darkness. It's bringing in the light to displace the darkness. And so this is why we have to partner with this government that needs wisdom, that goes before us. And in Proverbs 2, the admonition is, this is wisdom speaking, if you turn at my reproof, because wisdom, it, it, we have to be encountered with the spirit of truth. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. 
This is what we have to pay attention to. If we do it, the promise is, I will pour out my spirit to you. We have been praying for an outpouring of the spirit. And as much as we have been praying and asking, and yes, prayer and intercession is a key part. Repentance is. But wisdom is a part of this. Wisdom. Wisdom is going to be the one to open the door to this outpouring of the spirit. If we turn at the reproof. If we are willing to face the truth. Starting with ourselves. We can sue the truth about everybody else. <laughs> it's hard to discern it in us. And that's what's being tested. Can you face the truth? Can you own up to it? Can you learn to self-govern? Can we govern well in the body of Christ? Do we know what that even looks like? I mean, that's, that's why the Lord gave me the message, moving from sword to scepter, learning how to rule in the midst of your enemies. So the devil's not going away. Until that final day, he will continue to give his temper tantrums and make a scene. So we can't wait until that stops. No, it's in the midst of this that we are to rise up, remembering who we are, that we've been given a scepter to rule. We've used the sword for a long, long time, fighting things that we don't really need to be fighting. And he's calling us to stand, to know who we are as heirs. Because only heirs, sons and daughters, get a scepter. It gives you access. It gives you rights. But it's all in the posture of your heart. Do you know who you are? It's our identity that we take that place, that we can rule in the midst of our enemies. And so last night I believe that something was activated in the spirit because of this agreement. And even last night, you know, I was asking, Lord, just give us any kind of sign, any kind of indicator, because we have to test things. Okay, Lord, are we on track? And interestingly enough, I got a text this morning from one of our elders in our church, Dan. Um, he's a, an apostle. We commissioned him two years ago. He's prophetic. He doesn't send me messages many times, but he sent me this text that he had a vision this morning, and he didn't know what I was speaking last night. And he said, during worship today, I started seeing a bird's eye view of the Washington Monument sticking up out of a deciduous forest in early fall. The trees were colorful, helped to define each tree. I had a knowing that the monument was being shown to me, superimposed over the plot of land by the Potomac to identify the specific place, uh, piece of land where the capital city was built. Before the land was developed, it was pure. And in the natural state that God gave it, I saw superimposed over the land a large ghost-like spirit of sexual immorality. And I had another knowing come to me that over time this became a land under demonic strongholds and principalities, which remains to this day. I heard the spirit say that today is the turning point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he said, I, I asked unto what? What is the change? I heard that God was re-consecrating the land under our federal government buildings in Washington and displacing these demonic powers and bringing the land back to its previous pure state. <laughs> so what have we been, you know, talking about Eden? I mean, this is what God is trying to get us back to, our original state of how we're supposed to be functioning as sons and daughters. Hallelujah. Now, this is, this is a process, right? And we've been praying, and thank God for positive signs. But what I want to share with you this morning is the question is, as we have been praying and contending for these things, can we keep what God wants to give us? So we've had many revivals in this nation, many outpourings of the Spirit, manifestations, supernatural signs and wonders. And they've been good, and I, I've, I've tracked them in it seen how even the body of Christ, we've learned something through each one of them. There was something within each one of these movements, be it Toronto or Lakeland or Brownsville, that set something in place that was needed. And yet, you know, we haven't seen the fullness of this ecclesia rising up to see a shift in the culture because that's the true test of the outpouring of the spirit and what we're talking about. Is it actually changing things around us? Is it changing our culture? And unfortunately, what we've seen in the last 
decade or two is that things just keep getting worse. Now, in the good sense, our prayers are being answered because it's just all coming up. It's been there all along. We just haven't seen it. So thank God. He has been answering our prayers. We've, we've been seeing this. But I have been contending for this next outpouring. It's a keeper. It is going to change things because we're going to be changed. This is the key. He's calling for those who learn how to govern themselves and to govern in the body of Christ. Not to control, not to manipulate, because that's the devil's version. Manipulation, control, coercion. And he's looking for a people who know how to govern with wisdom, with health. So what I'm going to try to share this morning in the time given, I have no idea how much time I have, but I don't even want to know. <laughs> I'll just share what I need to this, this is a message that I've been bringing to every church that I go to because it is a message to the body of Christ, and that is freedom from religious and political spirits. We've talked about the religious spirit for years in the church, but as much as we talk about it, we're still bound by it <laughs> because we recognize it in everybody else and everything else, but not in ourselves. And the first book that I wrote over 15 years ago was Exposing the Religious Spirit in the Spirit-Filled Church. See, I came out of the 80s and 90s, you know, the charismatic, I was conference, I, I went to conference after conference, and I would, uh, I was hungry for the prophetic and hungry for the Lord, and this was after my own deliverance from the religious spirit, and then at that time, the religious spirit was thought, that's denominationalism, you know, it's the tradition, you know, singing by hymns or whatever it was, and so charismatic church, we're free, we're free, but I began to see over the years, well, we just have this, we just have our own liturgy. We have our own expectations and set of rules. You know, that you got to worship for an hour, you got to sing in tongues and do your flags and then do the ministry and people fall down and then you've met God. And the Lord said, you're operating under the same religious spirit as the past generation. So that's my book. <laughs> and so as I have grown in this, the key is to learn to recognize it because we just, we spiritualize things. And in our hunger for the Holy Spirit, we don't realize that there are other spirits that just try to counterfeit, and we don't recognize that's not even God. And remember, one of the things we've been talking about this whole weekend is that we have to change our mindsets. If we want to keep what God wants to give us, we need the mind of Christ. It's not focusing, I'm not talking about focusing on the devil, everything that's wrong, but we have to clear the clutter to receive what's right and what's God. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little backdrop, and then I'm going to highlight four different characteristics of these religious and political spirits. Now, just let me qualify. This is not a political message. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, as, as a prophetic voice, my charge is to look by, by the Spirit, what's going on by the Spirit. And so I want to I learn what is the source of everything that's happening here. And we need to recognize where is this thing. And it, and it goes into discerning of spirits, which I spoke on Thursday night, of recognizing is this demonic, is it Holy Spirit, is it just human spirit, flesh? We've got to recognize the source of these things. It helps to make more sense of what is COVID, what happened with the election, what, what's going on with all these things that we see here. We have to first understand what is happening in the spiritual realm because this isn't about parties it's not even about race it's not about all these things okay that others want to draw our attention to this is something by the spirit and this is where our oneness is going to come from once you have that revelation of what's happening in the spirit yes I see that too let's join in that okay so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list four characteristics, and this actually comes from, I have a, a video teaching series, Getting Free from Religious Jezebel Levine Spirits. It's from my own testimony. It's four hours. I, I don't think I have any more left there, but you can order them, WandaAlger.me, because I go through seven characteristics, and I pray you through each one of them. So I'm giving you a taste this morning. And as I list these, I am praying that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, 
that any, any way in which you're partnering with these without realizing it, we're going to get rid of them this morning, okay? Because at the end, I'm going to invite you to stand, and you're going to take ownership. You know what? I've got some stinking thinking, and I don't want to partner with that anymore, all right? So this is just a taste of what I do on a continual basis in trying to clear out that clutter that I can have the mind of Christ to be healthy, to be a good wine skin for this new wine. All right, so the, the key verse, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. This is what we're longing for, freedom of the Spirit, right? Now we have to look at how does the law fit into this. What do we do with rules? Do we just throw out all the rules, God's law, if we really want freedom? Well, let's look at this. Romans 7.7. 7 says, what then shall we say, that the law is sin? Well, by no means. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. The law is like, you, you ever go bowling and you know the bumper pads that you put up to keep your ball from going in the gutter? Well, think about the Ten Commandments. Those are the basic laws of God. They're like bumper guards. They keep us from going in the gutter. There is a place for the law. It's for our protection. It's for our safety. So lest we throw all the law, all rules out, we have to understand its place. There are laws of God's government, and they're good. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit, the Spirit has a law. The law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So there actually are two laws at work. The law of the Spirit, which has its boundaries and the law of sin and death. You're gonna know them by the fruit. Then in 2 Corinthians 3, five to six, our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now here's the thing, law is good, but it is only by the spirit that it's going to bring life. If you just set the law by itself, it brings death. And this is what the religious spirit wants to do. Only focus on the law, only focus on the rules. Void of the spirit. They have to work together to bring the fullness of understanding. And then 1 John 5, 3, why do we obey God? Is it because we have to? No, it says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Why? Because we do it for love. We do it because we know his heart. We want to please him. I want to get out anything that would obstruct my access to him in the throne. That's my motivation. It's not to keep the rules. It's to know him. And I begin to see any sin or weakness, that's a roadblock. You are keeping me from the throne room. I want to get rid of it. That's the kind of heart that the spirit will stir in us, that we want that kind of freedom. Our heart's desire is very important. See, God has given us a will. He, and he wants us to keep that freedom of choice. What are we dealing with right now in the land is freedom of choice. It's just as a little side note. Did you know that your conscience has authority in the spirit? Your conscience is your heart. It's what your heart tells you. Depending upon what you feed it, if you feed on the word of God, on the heart of God, that's going to mark your conscience, your heart, and you'll want the things of the Lord. Now, if you feed it junk, then your conscience will be defiled. But if you study scripture, conscience is greater than delegated authority in the spirit. It's God himself, God's word, and then your conscience because you're listening to the Lord. And then delegated authority. My husband, who's a pastor, he wrote this to our congregation a couple weeks ago, and Steve Schultz at Elijah List picked it up, posted it on Elijah List. Because as a pastor, Bobby was simply saying, our conscience is very powerful. And in terms of these mandates, all we're asking for is you have to realize people have to make that choice based upon their conscience. And when it violates their conscience, we have to pay attention to that because that has greater authority than even the delegated authority. And that's all we're asking for because it will violate conscience. 
And if you, if you look in, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul speaks about this, about conscience. So he, this is very important that we are free in our will to choose God for love. Now, of course, we know there's an antichrist spirit that's doing everything opposite of that. That wants to suck us into counterfeits, compromises. And we can't go there. So what is the religious spirit? Religion, if you actually look for the definition of religion in Merriam-Webster, it, it's defined as a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Attitudes, beliefs, and practices. That's really what, what religion is. It's a set of beliefs, okay? Well, what's a religious spirit? A religious spirit is any mindset that says you can only know God, you can only access God, you can only know the truth this way, one way. And it focuses on that experience, that doctrine, that method, that's the way. And here's where we don't recognize it because many times it's good. Someone has experienced it. For example, someone who has had addiction in their life and they've been bound by that and then in a meeting somewhere, miraculously, God touches them and they are instantly delivered. No more desire for it. Hallelujah. That's a powerful testimony. But if that person then proceeds to say, if you want delivered, it has to be this way. This is the only way that you can be delivered. You don't need any other thing. Just get someone to lay hands on you. Just believe. You see the fine line where that can become religious. It came out of a good heart and a good experience. But this is where we have to listen. Okay, Lord, what are you doing? This time, this way? You know, we got to stay updated with God on a daily basis, right? To know what he's doing. So, let's look at these four characteristics of a religious spirit. And the first one is legalism. And even in the study that I produced... I look in the New Testament because the Pharisees and Sadducees were the epitome of the religious spirit. So I draw a lot of my examples from them. And so in Matthew 15, 1 and 2, the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus and they asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. You know, it's pretty easy to see. Well, that's just a religious spirit because they had a set of rules. Even Jesus says in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. So this is the religious spirit. But how we hear it is a lie. And this is, I'm going to tell you what the lie is and then tell you what the truth is. The lie behind the legalism is if you really want to do what's right, follow the rules. If you really want to be okay and accepted, follow the rules. Do it this way, and then you'll be okay. You'll be accepted. You'll be loved, whatever it is. And you feel bound to this thing, i got to do it right. And you know what I've discovered in the body of Christ many times? It's actually because we want so much to do it right, we're actually afraid of missing it. We're afraid of doing something wrong, and then we can actually be operating in a religious spirit because we're not operating under grace. And realizing, you know what, I might miss it, but God will always recalibrate, recalibrate, get you back. <laughs> the legalism focuses on the rules, and it's often motivated by fear because we're afraid of missing it. We're afraid of missing him. And if we want a practical application, because this spirit of fear is huge, and this actually feeds a lot of these things. I read this about 75 years ago. Hermann Göring, Adolf Hitler's lieutenant, testified at the Nuremberg Court of Appeal being asked, how did you get the German people to accept all this? And he said, oh, it was really easy. It has nothing to do with Nazism. It has something to do with human nature. You can do it in a Nazi, socialist, communist regime, in a monarchy, even a democracy. The only thing that needs to be done is to enslave people to scare them. If you can find a way to scare people, you can make them do whatever you want. 
We are living this out. So we've got to nip fear in the bud. It is a spirit from hell, and we cannot operate from it. We've got to feed that conscience, faith, and trust in the Lord. Because what this religious spirit is trying, the political spirit, see, the religious and political spirit, they're cousins because they, they have the same agenda to force you to comply to the rules, doing it this way, always testing to see if you're doing it the right way, keeping score. Now, in your own life, it can apply a religious spirit, because I dealt with this for a long time, is that voice that says you're never praying enough, you're never reading the word enough. You know, right when you think that, okay, now I've got my quiet time, yes, they, then there's this little voice, you really should be reading scripture more. You really should be witnessing more. I mean, it's all, you can never do enough. I tell you, you need to rebuke that thing. That's not God. He's not a taskmaster. <laughs> and the political spirit, like I said, it, it's the constant call to conform. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to a yoke of slavery. This is the call. I like this when I'm saying I'm taking a stand right now. This is the stand, even more than a stand about the, the nation, about the president. I'm standing for this freedom in the Lord. That I will not partner with the yoke of slavery. The truth in all this is that we obey the law because we choose to, and we do it for love. That's the truth. That's what we need to decide and settle in our hearts. So you have to determine, are you, are you listening to that legalistic spirit? Are you being pulled into those kinds of thoughts, always questioning, always doubting? Are you standing in that freedom? You follow because you want to. You do it for love. Now, the second characteristic of the religious political spirit is rebellion against authority. Now, we can see it in the world, but we've got it rampant in the church. And it comes because we've been hurt by someone in leadership. We've been hurt by some other church somewhere. I mean, if I had to raise a hand, I, over half of you would raise your hands that you've all experienced that. Authority figures, it doesn't even have to be in the church, it can be at home. When you've been wounded by someone that was supposed to be watching over you and taking care of you, that marks you and you have to deal with that. Otherwise, it is a seed of resentment and bitterness and it becomes a filter, a f an unhealthy filter that you cannot see true authority and embrace it for your good. We rebel because the lie is we can't trust it. We can't trust it. Jesus was questioned a lot about his authority. You know, the Pharisees would say, who do you think you are, you know? Who gave you this authority? See, demons recognize legitimate authority. Why, why do you think, you know, President Trump is hated so much? Regardless of what you think about the man, he carries God's authority on him. You don't have to agree with me, but this is what I believe. It's legitimate. Authority can only come from, from God. No one can claim authority if, if God hasn't given it to them. It's control and manipulation. That's not authority. And while we're speaking about this, if you really want to know, if we're talking about governing authority, because this came up back in the 2016 election as well, of what it means to be a governing authority, not a pastor, not an elder, but a governing authority. In 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 13 to 15, the job description is right there, very clear. It says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. That's the job description of a governing authority. That's their job as president, governors, public officials. It's to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So if we use that as a litmus test, you tell me. You can get my book. I, I put that all out there. Very detailed. Because this is rampant in the church of what is authority 
and what should it look like? And again, we're, we're so skewed because of our own experiences that we haven't learned to embrace spiritual authority as a good thing. It's for our good, it's for our protection. And I love, you know, Seattle Revival Center, it, you have a culture of honor. You've, you've put that, you've instilled that in your culture. That needs to seep out. The people do see that. I mean, you demonstrate it so beautifully. But to embrace this authority, because the lie has to be broken, that you can't trust it, that it's controlling. No, it gives great freedom. And so if this form of, of the religious spirit, this rebellion against authority is, is working on you, it's going to cause you to pull back from anyone that has authority. And you're going you're gonna to hear these voices saying, don't trust them. Don't trust, they got an agenda. Watch what they do. You know, don't, you know, just stay on the outside. And, and it will limit even coming into and being a part of a church family. Because we are so afraid, again, the fear, we're so afraid of joining it and being hurt again. This is why it's so important that we've got to get rid of any wounds, resentments of the past. You've got to forgive. Amen. That bitterness is a seed. It, it, it'll kill the anointing of God. You've got to get rid of it. That political spirit takes this rebellion, and what have we experienced? It will question, usually attack anyone that has legitimate authority anymore. You know, it's almost laughable. Anyone that actually in the media gets attacked, you know, chances are they're probably on the good side. <laughs> because anyone that really is on the good side, yeah, they, they're going to feel the heat. The political spirit wants to pit us against each other, attack legitimate authority. But the truth is, God's authority can be trusted. We can trust his authority. And you know, sometimes, and this, this is all part of my own journey, my testimony, of learning, it doesn't mean that I agree with, with everything that my spiritual authority starts with my husband, my pastor, our overseers. And yes, you know, in, in the political sphere, we have authorities. It doesn't mean that I'm going to agree with everything they say. This is why we have to be led of the Spirit. But if we honor and we trust the Lord, and especially in the marriage, there's times the Lord's tested me on it where I knew, I knew I was right and he was wrong, okay? <laughs> but I could just hear from heaven, this is a test. <laughs> For the next 60 days, we're going to be watching you. I knew that I had to decide, okay, am I going to keep fighting him on this, rebelling against him, or am I just going to trust, Lord, if this is right, thank you for backing me up. I'm going to trust you with this. And I did, and I tell you what, after, I had to do it a while. <laughs> it took more than once. But after a while, see, God backed me up. I didn't have to do a thing. And Bobby realized that he was wrong. <laughs> if he were here, he would have his own stories. <laughs> But see, this goes to our heart attitude of how we respond to these things. D can we partner with Holy Spirit? We've got to clear out the clutter, determine God's authority can be trusted. It's for our good. The third characteristic is fear of man. Fear of man is a part of this religious system. The opposite is the fear of the Lord. Because if we're really walking in the fear of the Lord, there's no room for fear of man. But the fear of the Lord has to come with revelation. And see, this is the beautiful thing about what God initiated last night. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is what brings the fullness of that truth from the Lord. Is understanding clearly who he is. And who the enemy is. But here's how I define fear of man. It's an unhealthy preoccupation of what others think. I mean, it's almost like an unhealthy soul tie. You are so tied to what someone else is thinking. You are so afraid of what they're going to think. You're afraid of losing a friend. You're afraid of losing a connection with someone. You're afraid of losing a job. That fear of man... Luke, uh, John 12, 42, it says, Many even among the leaders believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. The lie in this 
is I'll lose too much if I stand for the truth. I'm going to lose something. Now, the reality is that in these days, there is a practical aspect that you might lose something in the natural. But that's why we have to live by the Spirit. We're, we're not of this world. We're of the kingdom. Right? Because the truth is, my stand for eternity is worth any temporary loss. I fix my eyes on that prize. Not these. Whatever these are. I want to hear, well done, faithful servant. I mean, even Job, who lost so much. If you understand from an eternal perspective, he lost nothing. Even his children, if they really were for the Lord, they're with him. He didn't lose anything. And his story has been a testimony for generations. So this fear of man, unfortunately, fear feeds it, but also insecurity. Because we haven't settled our identity. We haven't settled that it's okay if someone thinks that I'm weird. It's okay if someone thinks I've, I've lost touch with reality. I had an experience. I, don't, I forget if I've shared it here or not. I posted on Facebook. This was, oh, two weeks ago. It was about the Southwest Airline, um, you know, the canceling of flights because of the mandate kind of thing. Um, and I have two, two older sisters who have throughout my lifetime challenged me and tested me. I think I told someone else, I, I can identify a lot with Joseph and his older brothers. I have older sisters. And through this whole thing, they have, take, they have taken a different route. They believe differently than I do, but they've remained pretty quiet for whatever reason, probably because they were vacationing together. Um, they saw that post, and so my one sister posted, Wanda, just quit. Just quit. You are out of touch with reality. Stop all this prophesying stuff. Just quit. Okay. <laughs> I know my sister. It's classic. And then my other sister, you know, kind of had a similar comment. And, you know, I I'm thinking, first I'm thinking, well, I'd rather have my reality than yours. <laughs> you know? And I know time, time will tell. Time will, you know, I, I keep thinking about Joseph. There's going to come a time. <laughs> when the truth is seen. But, you know, up until this... I don't care. It's okay with me that they think that. I've settled it because I'm secure in who I am. And when I know what, what the Lord has shown me is true and right and good, I can't do anything but stay in that. I can't. I can't move. It's not worth it to me. So this fear of man can be debilitating. And we've got to make a decision. And it is an individual decision. No one else can make it for you. You have to determine, I walk in the fear of the Lord. And it's worth any temporary loss because I want to be faithful to the Lord. Now, the fourth characteristic is unbelief. This is a part of the religious system. It's unbelief. And faith is the counter to that. Faith in the Lord. Our faith is fixed. Again, by the Spirit. And it manifests, the spirit of unbelief is manifesting, especially these days, through sarcasm, mockery, hatred. It's the spirit of unbelief. A refusal to think about God. Faith in God. Anyone that dares to stand for God or speak of God. Ridicule. But we have to deal with that unbelief in our own mind. Do we really believe? John 12, 37 says, though Jesus had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Maybe you've experienced it this last year as you have been waking up to things and you've got some articles and information and videos and you send it someone, to someone who is asleep and doesn't understand, this is going to wake them up. And it's like nothing, nothing. No matter how much you send them, it's like they will not believe. That's because the spirit of unbelief. 
When that spirit of unbelief is in operation, it doesn't matter what you give them. They, they can't. They can't see it. They are blinded by unbelief. So stop wasting your time. <laughs> Don't get frustrated. Pray. Amen. Faith has to arise. They have to have a revelation in their heart that they want to hear the truth. It's so many times we don't want to hear the truth. We're afraid of it. Yeah, fear just keeps coming up again and again. And I often recognize that spirit of unbelief because there's this knee-jerk response that says, that can't be true. That can't be true. Now, whether it's said or felt, it's just this default that I can't go there. I can't consider that. It starts with us, again, of what we allow Holy Spirit to bring to us about our own lives. Are we really open? Okay, Lord, show me. <laughs> Whatever. I don't want to walk in unbelief. I don't want to be blinded. I want to see what I need to see. And when we're really walking in faith, when we're really settled, we're going to want to know more. Lord, show me what I need to know. Help me to understand this. The political spirit of unbelief is trust the science, trust the knowledge, trust all of this. It's not going to require any faith in God. I mean, that is the antichrist spirit. Trust in all these things. Remove your faith in God. The truth is, John 20, 29, what Jesus told Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. We don't have to see it to believe it. It's a revelation of the heart, of the spirit. You just know. Many times what the Lord shows me even prophetically, it's just I know by the spirit. That produces faith. So these are the four characteristics in terms of the religious, the political spirits. And these are the things that we have to grapple with on an ongoing basis. Because in the days to come, there is going to be much more exposure, much more revealing. The spirit of truth is coming. I mean, he's here, but moving. And I believe that there's going to be some shocking things that we're going to have to deal with. And we're going to have to know how to steward, how to share them, how to talk about them. People are going to be shell-shocked. And the body of Christ is going to be needed to be anchored rightly in what we believe and why. Because these worlds, the spirit and the flesh are colliding. And you know, the, the thing is, as we have been praying for, you know, this outpouring of the spirit, these realities, how long have we been praying for heaven to come to earth? That we can, we can see what's there. You know, this revival center is, is but one place that has longed for and nurtured a culture that's open to the supernatural realm. You want those realities. You, you want to stir that faith to believe for those things, to walk in those things. And here's what the Lord has indicated to me because I believe, now this is what he has said. It was always his first choice that we would embrace the fullness, fullness of his spirit through our desire for what's in heaven. But unfortunately, there is a large part of even the evangelical church in, in the nation, in the globe, that cannot receive that truth. That can't be true. They haven't been able to accept it. And so the Lord reluctantly, I'm gonna have to show you the dark side. I'm going to have to show you the reality of the dark side for you to believe. It's not my first choice. But because you could not believe, you're going to have to see this. I believe this is what's going to usher in the fear of the Lord. When the dark side is seen, not to glorify it, but it's going to be a wake-up call. Because everything that God has, see, the enemy has been working year after year to counterfeit it. But we, we haven't recognized the counterfeit because we, we haven't known the real, the fullness of the real. This is, you know, what our sister carries is, is this world is real. We can access it. And so as these things come out to see this is going to be our charge, 
governing by wisdom to help bring people up. Even though this stuff is going to be exposed and seen, let's lift people up to the real kingdom that we belong to. So I'm, I'm going to invite the, the worship team or Josh, whoever, just to come because we're just going to go into a time of business here, of praying through these things. Because, again, this is a part of you taking ownership and being a wineskin that you can allow the Holy Spirit to, to come, that everything would be removed so that Holy Spirit can come. So I'm going to call each one of these, and I'm going to invite you to stand if you have identified with one of these characteristics, and then I'm just going to lead you through a short prayer. It's just a taste of simply taking ownership and determining I, re I do not want to partner with that anymore. I renounce that in my thinking. And we're inviting the spirit of truth to come and do a work. All right? And then at the end of these four, I have a corporate declaration for the house that we're going to say together. So first of all, legalism. This part of legalism, following the rules, a fear of doing it wrong, perhaps even critical of others. If you can identify with what I described, I want you to stand right now. That you can hear that religious spirit in whatever way. It's never enough harassing you, being a taskmaster, a fear of missing him, whatever it is. Amen. All right, repeat after me. Lord, forgive me for listening to the spirit of legalism. Forgive me for thinking. I have to follow the rules to be okay and accepted. I renounce those thoughts and attitudes, ideas and beliefs that are contrary to your word, your heart, and your character. I choose to do what's right because I want to, not because I have to. Cleanse me with the spirit of truth that I might know your voice, your heart, and your ways more clearly. And Father, I just pray as these have renounced these legalistic thoughts, Lord, there would be a freedom of the spirit. I break off those oppressive spirits of control and manipulation, the pressure to conform and I pray, fill them with the Holy Spirit and a freedom to choose out of love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right. Now, next one is rebellion against authority. And I do give you permission to stand more than once if you need to. <laughs> rebellion against authority. Now, this might be because you've got a wound in your heart against someone, and it's been hard to trust. It's been hard to trust leaders. People who are in authority positions. You just have this thing in your heart, disillusioned, and you want to embrace God's authority. All right. Repeat after me. Lord, forgive me for listening to the spirit of rebellion against authority. Forgive me for thinking that authority is bad and that I can't trust those in leadership. I renounce those thoughts and attitudes, ideas and beliefs that are contrary to your word, your heart, and your character. I trust your authority in my life and those you have appointed for me. Cleanse me with the spirit of truth that I might know your voice, your heart, and your ways more clearly. Now, Father, I just pray over these that you would break off that distrust, that disillusionment from past wounds. God, for those who have been hurt, I pray that by the balm of Gilead, Lord, your spirit would come in like an anointing oil. Father, to remove those stingers, that you would give them a heart of love for those in leadership. And that, Father, they would have a turning of that authority, Lord, in their lives that is good. Father, I pray even the feeling of being alone, that they can't join together. God, I pray just a magnetism between them and those that you have put in their life to bring healing and restoration. Heal the hurts, Lord. Fill them with your spirit, with the joy of surrender and a supernatural trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, this third one is fear of man. 
Fear of man. You know you need a greater fear of the Lord to take a stand. You've been afraid of what others think. You've been afraid to make those hard choices. And you, you know you want to make the right stand. Thank you, Jesus. This is powerful, guys, what you're doing, taking a stand here. All right, repeat after me. Lord, forgive me for listening to the spirit of fear of man. Forgive me for thinking I'll lose too much if I stand for the truth. I renounce those thoughts and attitudes, ideas and beliefs that are contrary to your word, your heart, and your character. I desire to walk in the fear of the Lord and please you above all else. Cleanse me with the spirit of truth that I might know your voice, your heart, and your ways more clearly. And Father, as they have prayed this prayer, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to see the prize at the end, that they would not be stuck on any temporary loss, but the joy that is set before them, that they would endure the temporary loss, and they would faithfully serve you, and it would even increase their boldness, their confidence, knowing they are standing for the right thing, for the right God. And that they could share that and demonstrate it that would draw others out of bondage and the fear of the Lord would be released in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. The last one. Unbelief. Unbelief. That's a hard time accepting some of this stuff. A hard time. You have this knee-jerk reaction like, I can't believe that. Or you're afraid of the truth. You're afraid of facing some things. And you want to be free from that to have absolute faith in the Lord. All right. Repeat after me. Lord, forgive me for listening to the spirit of unbelief. Forgive me for thinking that can't be true. I renounce those thoughts and attitudes, ideas and beliefs that are contrary to your word, your heart, and your character. I choose to believe Help my unbelief. Cleanse me with the spirit of truth that I might know your voice, your heart, and your ways more clearly. Now, Father, I break off the spirit of the age that has blinded the minds of these from the supernatural realm, the truths of your spirit that will set them free. Lord, I pray that you would give them a faith that the uh, impossibilities become possible. Give them a higher faith to see and hear past the natural realm. And I pray that your word would rise up in them to overcome the temptation to fall back into unbelief, that their faith would be fixed in you, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All right, now I want everybody to stand. And you're going to make this declaration together over your house. And this can be for your own home, but also for this house and even this region. You're taking a stand to hold the ground to be this wineskin of the Lord. All right? Thank you, Jesus, for exposing the work of the religious and political spirits in our lives. Forgive us for listening to these spirits and following their lies. Through the blood of Jesus, and his victory at the cross, we now sever any ties and agreements with these religious and political spirits in our midst and declare our allegiance to Christ Jesus alone. Holy Spirit, come and fill us afresh with your indwelling and manifest presence so we can know your voice and testify to your truth for the sake of Christ's kingdom. Help us to renew our minds and be transformed by perfect love that casts out every fear. We declare the true liberty and freedom in the Holy Spirit would reign in this place and be reflected in this church through our attitudes and actions, our words and our worship, we choose to walk in the mind of Christ, the heart of the Father, 
and the freedom of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Can we just give a big thank you to Juan and Alger? Wasn't that amazing? Wasn't it so great? Such a, such a timely word. I imagine there's no one here that's been wrestling with the religious or political spirit. I'm sure that, yeah. Hey, um, God bless you. Listen, uh, we will be back tonight at uh, 6 uh, p.m., okay? And uh, Josh, you're going to be leading us into worship tonight. Oh, I can't wait. It's going to be so good. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, we're going to have a bit of a conversation, a very unscripted uh, conversation uh, we'll be diving into uh, uh, Nephilim and all kinds of uh, crazy, I'm just kidding. Or am I? Anyways, you'll want to be here. Get here early, um, and it's going to be great. Man, this whole weekend has been just absolutely phenomenal. And again, thank you so much, Anna and Wanda, for being with us, for imparting. This morning has been powerful. So listen, um, uh, if you're in King County, uh, have a great lunch not at a restaurant. Uh, otherwise, hey, we'll see you tonight um, <laughs> at 6 p.m. Take care. <laughs>